on your phones and on and on your laptops uh, ready to learn more about this. So just waiting for a few more people to join in. We are expecting a few more people into this room. So just keep you know, keep letting us know which city is joining in from and hang in there for just a few seconds here or there, and we'll be able to quickly go live and we'll start this session. Yes. Great. Um, we've got quite a few people. I've got about 50 odd people who've messaged in the chat. There are people from IIT Kharagpur, Mumbai, Bangalore, Noida, um, uh, someone from Germany as well. So thanks so much for joining in. Uh, uh, Vishal's from Indore. Welcome, Vishal. A um, lot of people from the length and breadth of the country, a lot of people from IIT Kanpur, I see. So thanks so much for uh, you IIT Kanpur folks who have joined in. Um, I'm going to quickly give an uh, introduction. Uh, we've got Shaunak from IIM Ahmedabad. Thank you, Shaunak, for, for joining us as well. Um, what we'll do is we'll first learn a little more about uh, Berkeley and their master's in financial engineering program that all of us might have some interest in. And then we'll move on to the masterclass that Professor Ali has prepared for each and every one of you. We're close to 200 people in this room. So I'm going to uh, quickly give this platform to Jacob. Jacob, thank you so much for taking out time. Uh, in you know it's it's close to about 8 a.m there back in california so thanks so much for starting your day early and taking uh 200 of us through a little bit about uh what berkeley house is all about and what's the masters in financial engineering program all about so over to you jacob sorry jacob you're still on mute if you'd like to Thank you so much, everyone, and appreciate your time, Shirag, for uh, the brief introduction. So thank you so much to all the participants for being with us on the line today. We're so excited to be able to share with you a little bit more about our one-year financial engineering program here at the world-renowned Berkeley Haas Institution. Uh, this is the third series in a part of a broader uh, partnership that we are launching with SEED. With that in mind, I will just be going through a brief presentation of the program, but for those of you who are interested in the broader presentation, by all means, feel free to follow up with us after the session, and we'll be more than happy to send you the full presentation. We want to leave plenty of time for the master class today, which is the main portion of today's session. Without further ado, let me talk a little bit about our one-year program in financial engineering. So one of the things that we differentiate ourselves as opposed to some of the other graduate quantitative finance programs out there in the market is we are indeed a one year or a 12 month program. This is quite in contrast to many of our peer institutions out there. And it has large implications with respect to the return on investment on your education and program. It means less time in school, a quicker time to getting your degree, and therefore a quicker time to get back into the workforce. And again, all of these things have an implication of your ROI. So again, in just one year's time, we will prepare you for the skills and the knowledge that you need to launch or propel your career forward in the areas of quantitative finance, data science, and financial technology. So again, very proud of this. We here have some of the top faculty of the entire world who are doing cutting-edge research in their respective fields, one of whom, of course, you will hear from in just a few moments' time. Now, our curriculum is designed exclusively for MFE students. Many of our classes are designed explicitly to prepare you for industry and, again, to make sure that you are ready to go when you hit the banks, asset management firms, hedge funds, financial technology companies. In addition, 95% of our classwork is team-based. We do this because we think it's very representative of what all of you will have to deal with when you go out into the workforce, and that's to say, you will be working with people from all different kinds of backgrounds, disciplines, countries around the world. This year, we are uh, poised to have an all-time program record of over 20 nationalities represented in this program. Again, a highly diverse group of individuals uh, and a uh, very, very select few. We go leave no stone unturned all around the world. Another unique part about our program is we make use of independent study projects. And this is where you'll be working with companies on real problems, real challenges that they may be facing. And again, this is in addition to a three-month paid internship, which typically takes place during the fall. Many of our students are going on to intern at firms like Morgan Stanley, BlackRock, Point72, among many other leading financial institutions. 
Now, as you're considering what graduate finance program or quantitative finance program to go to, one of the important things to keep in mind is, of course, the reputation of the program, as well as the reputation of the institution. Now, we here in the financial engineering program are a top-ranked program by some of the leading publications out there, including TFE Times, QuantNet, and RiskNet. In addition, we are located at one of the world-renowned business institutions, that is to say the Haas School of Business, consistently ranked one of the top business schools in the entire world. And finally, you'll be at the world-renowned UC Berkeley. We are one of the leading research and global university institutions out there. Again, all of these three things combine to what I like to call a triple helix effect. You will benefit both from the program reputation, school reputation, and broader university institution reputation. It's a powerful tool and one which will serve you well as you go out into industry and prepare for your interviews. Now, very quickly, I will mention for some of you on the line who are working professionals or who are considering studying part-time, we do now have a two-year part-time program available. That program can be done on a remote basis. It is a much smaller program. Our flagship program remains our one-year in-person program here in Berkeley, California. But again, just so that it's on your radar, we do have a two-year part-time available that is designed for remote working professionals. Uh, to be clear, F-1 visas are not issued for this program, whereas in contrast for our flagship one-year program, you will be studying on an F-1 visa and you will be eligible for STEM OPT. STEM OPT does give you up to three years to work in the United States. Now, while I'm on the topic of working in the United States, we have a fantastic track record of helping our students to launch very interesting, challenging, and lucrative careers here in the United States. As you can see here, we have a highly personalized career services office where we help our students secure internships and full-time opportunities. Some of the highest salaries compared to any other program out there on the market. Again, this is a very lucrative field and one which will set you up very well financially. This comes back to the ROI equation I mentioned earlier, which is it's no surprise that many US-based uh, graduate programs are priced at quite a high level, right? That's no secret. We're transparent about that. But one of the things that you want to keep in mind, of course, is the return on that investment. And just right away, you will be able to command well into the six figures. And again, these are just base salaries. These do not even get into year-end bonuses. And from there, the earnings growth goes up significantly in years two, three, four, and five, with many of our alumni making well over four to $600,000 just three to five years out of the program. So again, a tremendous ROI, a great field to be in, a growing field to be in, and one which will set you up very well. So again, you'll have recognized experts who are working with you every step of the way. Again, myself having worked at Goldman Sachs, as well as the leading retained search firm, Hydrogen Struggles, before making the move over to higher education. You'll benefit from three different alumni networks. That's to say the program network, the school network, as well as the UC Berkeley Institution Network, which also has world-renowned computer science and engineering programs. Again, we are a STEM OPT recognized program, so you will have up to three years to work in the United States without needing to worry about any kind of H-1B visa process. Having said that, many of our partner employers are well familiar with the H-1B visa process and do obviously sponsor our international students. Uh, we'll be putting on all kinds of different uh, workshops, mock interviews, job fairs, and again, you will be well supported throughout your journey here. Our students are going into a wide variety of areas, whether it's banks, asset management firms, hedge funds, and a wide variety of functional areas, whether it's portfolio management, trading, data science, machine learning, or strats. And again, a sampling of some of the firms which have come to recruit and hire our students. You'll see leading investment banks, Morgan Stanley, institutional asset managers like BlackRock, consulting companies like McKinsey, hedge funds like Citadel. So needless to say, no matter where you're looking to take your career, Berkeley's financial engineering program can help you get there. Now, without further ado, again, the longer, more formal presentation can be definitely access by just emailing us. We'll drop in our email at various points in this presentation. Let me now shop uh, and turn it back over to Shirag, 
so that he can kick off the next part of this presentation. Thank you so much for being with us here again, and we look forward to working with you. Thank you so much, Jacob, for that wonderful presentation. Before I move on, um, just a couple of things I want to talk to uh, each and every 336 of you who have joined in here. Firstly, thank you so much for doing that. Um, uh, firstly, there's a poll that I want to run. So on your screen right now, you will quickly see a poll question. There, are, There is, you know, the... Two poll questions are there. Uh, the first one is, which industry are you most interested in? So uh, if you're joining in from the phone, please do check up a, a, a poll tab that is there on your mobile screen. We've already got close to 25 people who've responded. We're waiting for um, a large percentage of you. So the first question is, which industry? industry you most interested in? Is it asset management, trading, uh, tech or fintech, investment banking, or the, you know, the industry that you're interested in is not on this list. So you can click on the other option. So uh, what, which industry rather are you most interested in? And there's another question as well. So please uh, don't only, you know, answer one question and forget the other. The next question is, which function within uh, BFSI are you most interested in? So which, which function within banking and the financial service industry are you most interested in? Is it portfolio management, quantitative research, trading, data science, uh, deal strategy or deal structuring or product management? Um, and there are more options if you scroll down this strategy, risk modeling, and if you're interested in this, but your area of expertise or your area of interest is not there, you can click on the other option. Uh, we've got close to 180 of you who've responded, just waiting for 20 more of you to respond once we reach the 200 figure. We've got close to 55% of 55 percentage of you who've responded to this. So if you haven't responded, click on that poll tab. We're still waiting for a few more responses. We want to know which, interest, uh, which industry you you're most interested in and uh, within BFSI, what are you most interested in, in terms of which function? All right. I don't think we're going to reach this. This poll is going to be only for the next 10 seconds. So if you haven't still uh, clicked the poll question, please do, do please do so and answer a question that's there. So uh, just a few more seconds. We need one more person to reach 200. All right. Perfect. So I'm going to share the results on the screen for everyone concerned, including the panelists. Uh, we can see that close to 50% of you are interested in tech or fintech, which is which is a great, uh, you know, great place to be, you know, especially, you know, since you're here, about 26% of you, one out of four of you are interested neither in asset management or in trading. So, um, and, and large percentage also in investment banking. So I think that's, that's just for the panelists to also get a feel of what kind of audience we have here. And within banking and the financial service industry, most of you, about 35% of you are interested in data science and some of you in portfolio management, product management, risk model, modeling uh, as well. So these are some of the things that some of your colleagues uh, in this particular room are very interested in. So I think those are some of the insights that all of us can take back. And uh, Professor Ali, who I'm going to quickly introduce uh, to each one of you right now, uh, will certainly be appreciating some of the results from uh, what you guys are interested in. So a little bit about Professor Ali Khatbhut that I'd want to quickly talk about. He's an assistant professor at... Uh, you know, in the finance group at Berkeley Haas. Um, now he's already completed his PhD in economics from MIT, and he also is PhD in electrical engineering and computer science from the University of Michigan. Uh, his research, uh, what he's really passionate about includes uh, information frictions, liquidity, banking, market microstructure, big data, and contracts. And here, uh, he's here today to talk to each and every one of us, which is the main, which is the hero part of this uh, session on this masterclass today uh, is on big data and deep learning in finance. What are the opportunities and challenges? So uh, less of me and more of Professor Ali uh, for the next close to 45, uh, you know, 35 to 40 minutes. So uh, over to you, Professor Ali, if you want to share your screen and take us through the next sometime, uh, the best part of uh, the next 40 minutes, that'd be great. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And uh, Shira, thank you so much, Jacob. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to present this uh, short class. It's just like half, half an hour. I hope you all enjoyed the class. So one second, let me 
make this a little bit because I want to see my slide myself. Okay, so one question. So if whenever there's a question, we're going to address the question at the end, right? That's right. Okay. We'll take all the questions at the end. Awesome. Okay, good. So uh, the title of this class is Big Data, Deep Learning and Finance, uh, Overview Opportunities and Challenges. So I'm going to uh, start with uh, methods and algorithms that we usually see in machine learning and deep learning, and the trade-off between different methods, different algorithms, and the issues corresponding to these methods um, which is general, global in terms of applications. And then I'm going to focus mostly on the finance applications uh, we have used so far among these, uh, for these methods in different uh, area of finance from industry and usage. So as you see in this figure, actually, there are several methods and algorithms uh, in machine learning. And there's a trade-off between these methods and uh, algorithms from interpretability and the prediction performance on power of these methods. So we start from the top left, we see uh, like lasso, elastic net, reach, and these are like uh, uh, linear methods with the penalty terms, that these penalty terms uh, can be in L1 or L2 norm. And uh, they are pretty good in terms of like interpretability because they are simple to understand what's going on. I'm going to talk about them as well a little bit. When we go towards the right, we see more prediction performance. However, what we lose is the interpretability of these uh, potential uh, algorithms. For example, here we have trees. Uh, or DC, uh, three, de uh, three dependence algorithms. It's starting from decision tree, which is very simple. I'm going to show you as well others that work. To random forest and uh, boosted uh, methods like um, auto boost and gradient boosting methods. Again, as we go towards the right, we have a lot of uh, prediction power. We have they perform very well out of sample, but they are like black box. It's difficult to understand what's going on inside these algorithms. And the more famous ones, the deep learning uh, approaches or based on neural network that we see in this uh, basically Southeast that are and performance in terms of prediction power is very good, but they are like literally black box to understand what's going on inside these algorithms. However, they are very good. And there are like other ones in the middle uh, too, like a uh, uh, support vector machine, et cetera, SVC and SVR that are in the middle. Moreover, as you see, these algorithms are different in terms of uh, type of data that we are dealing with. If we are working with like uh, tabular data, these linear methods with penalty terms and decision trees perform very well, and they are for those type of met, uh, type data. However, if we work with uh, unconventional data or alternative data like uh, audio, video, image, text, this type of things, then uh, we're gonna use a neural network or deep learning methods. Again, in neural network deep learning method, we have a lot of approaches from MLP and like ANN and DNN, kind of a shallow and deep neural nets to more advanced versions like transformers and, and like uh, neural nets that are trained to deal with sequences and time series like LSTM and RNN to neural nets that are uh, performing well for uh, classification of images like uh, convolution neural nets, CNN, etc. So I cannot say actually which method is better than the other method. What we, uh, as a modeler, based on the question we are dealing with, we have to decide which model we need to pick. If we, if interpretability is important for us, so we need to pay costs in terms of prediction power and go with these type of methods like lasso, reach, elastic net. For example, if you are working in a bank and you want to decide whether you're going to, uh, you know, issue, a, uh, if you want to lend to a borrower, then you may not be able to use neural net because it's difficult to, you know, reject a case because of the regulations imposed there. So we need to understand what's going on, why, what is the reason that we are rejecting the case. For example, for that reason, we need to use more transparent methods. We can, we can understand what is inside the box. If you are in, for example, hedge fund, maybe, 
that we only care about out of sample prediction, we may need to go to more advanced neural net methods in order to beat the market. So overall, these nonlinear methods perform very well in prediction in compared to purely linear methods like OLS. And uh, depending on the dependent variable that we are facing, and typically in this type of problems, uh, we are dealing with either regression problems or a classification problems. By the way, in this class, I only focus on supervised learning. As you know, in machine learning, there are other fields as well, like unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning. But the main application uh, to finance is about uh, supervised learning and reinforcement learning a little bit, but I don't have time to talk about reinforcement learning, hopefully another time. But supervised learning is the most important class, subfield of machine learning and deep learning, particularly for finance. So as you see, these regressions, if the dependent variable is continuous, our problem is going to be a kind of a regression problem. If the dependent variable that we are trying to predict, for example, if binary or categorical, uh, we have a classification problem. For example, if we are trying to predict the stock price tomorrow, or we are trying to update our weight in our portfolio, which is a, a continuous variable, we are dealing with a regression problem. If you are dealing with like, and uh, dependent variable is, I see, let's say the images of previous stock prices, and I decide based on the images to buy or sell or do nothing, then my problem is a classification problem. And as you see, these methods all can handle, uh, most of these can handle both regression and classification problem from regression, regularization, uh, boosting trees and neural net both can do both and type of dependent variables. For example, here, another example, I wanna just show you uh, some uh, numbers in terms of the prediction power of these methods. Here, I'm trying to uh, do uh, in, uh, in the data, I'm working with the house price prediction and I'm going to apply two methods and compare the prediction power of these two methods and compare, to, and compare it with the linear regression. So the next uh, panel is decision tree, uh, which is basically, think of it like decision tree is just a flow chart. It's like a combination of set of, combination of, or a set of, um, you know, a step functions that you, uh, used uh, to basically find a relationship between your, between your data or features and the dependent value. And the right one is the uh, neural network, which is this one is just uh, basically uh, like a deep neural network that has multi-layer inside. So the data and the, you, your input is the data and the output is, let's say, the price. The input is going to be like the features that you have in the house, for example, the location, number of rooms, and you know, zip code and uh, age, etc. These are all going to this. These are the features, and you have a lot of like uh, the hidden layer. I'm going to talk about it a little bit, and then your output is the price. Now. When you train these models, for example, these two or uh, other methods, you can see, I can then I can compare what I could get from the comparison of using these methods in terms of like the prediction performance to a linear regression in that uh, OLS. And as you see, the prediction performance of uh, like decision tree, lasso, which is an OLS plus a imperialization term, elastic net, and reg ridge regression, and random forest, which is, which, is, which is a kind of a tree, ensemble methods, and boosted tree, all of them performs much better than OLS in terms of uh, prediction performance. In particular, if we zoom in and see the average pricing error of OLS compared to boosted regression tree, as you see here, the average error for different quantile of my data is much higher than uh, the uh, boosted regression tree. So overall, uh, which makes sense, you have a more complex uh, function or complex mapping. You are looking for a complex mapping to map your features to your dependent variable. As a consequence, you're gonna get a better out of sample prediction. But what is the issue corresponding to this? 
Sure, they have a good, very good out of sample prediction, but there is one potentially very important issue corresponding to these difficult or more complex methods. And the main one is overfitting. What is overfitting? Basically, overfitting in, in like in the context, in the textbook context, is called the uh, trade-off between bias and variance. And when it's not a good uh, is a big issue, and is actually we need to uh, it's important to take care of it. Usually, the way to take care of it is to uh, have more training data or use regularization. Well, let me show you first what does overfitting mean, and I can show you with this very simple figure. So overfitting, basically, if you see the right panel, basically you pick up noise. The model, so this, the orange dot is the data, the relationship between X and Y. But when I use very complex uh, methods, then my method become very sensitive to what's going on in the data, so that I sometimes I pick up noise. So if there is a shock, I try to catch it. So then I cannot explain what's going on if I don't see the data. Basically, the auto sample prediction of the model uh, becomes very bad or very low, poorly performs in auto sample. So this is a sample of overfitting. This is a sample of underfitting. As you see, when I when look when I see this orange and data, which is the relationship between X and Y. This is just a linear regression. It still says something, but it doesn't say the extra thing that I see in the data, which is the convexity between X and Y. So I see this is a good fit, this is an underfit, and this is an overfit. So overfitting is a very common issue for these advanced methods or like more complex methods. And how to deal with it is to use a regularization or a training, a bigger training data set. How to pick a model? So as I said, there are lots of models we discussed, like from the left to right, remember, from the linear method with the quadratic cost or L1 cost or two norm cost to decision trees, uh, three models and the neural method. All of them perform pretty well. Okay, they could they do pretty well out of sample as well. But which one we pick when we are dealing with the problem? Well, the answer is, uh, is very difficult. There is no, model that is superior in every aspect. Again, as a modeler, when you're facing with a problem, that's our decision to pick a method that deal, that actually can address that question very well. For example, as I said, if you are working in a bank and we have a lot of regulations there and we want to issue a loan, then simplicity is important for us because we need to explain for what reason we are going to reject uh, the case. If you are, and as you see, for example, linear regression, logistic regression perform very well. Uh, and they, well, they are simple and interpretation is pretty good, but uh, the out of sample prediction is pretty, uh, it's not that good. Again, R squared could be negative. They cannot handle all large data sets. Um, well, not robust overfitting and, and basically cannot handle nonlinearity in the data. As I said, for example, if you have a non kind of a convexity or concavity in your data, linear methods cannot capture it, but they are good, in, they are pretty simple. On the other hand, neural networks is pretty good to handle uh, nonlinearity and uh, large data sets, and also when you are dealing with uh, basically many features. However, they are not simple. So again, they are all perfect. They are not in what they do, but in the, there are issues with them as well. But as a modeler, we need, uh, it's our job to pick the one that is relevant for the question we have in hand. Now let's, um, I want to have an overview before going to the applications of an overview on uh, some of the methods and the big picture uh, for, uh, for among these different methods. So one thing is that actually all of these methods are very similar. So in all of these uh, methods, and uh, basically you want to understand this function, unknown function that can capture your features to your dependent value. But when I am looking for these functions, sometimes I need to impose a subset that I'm looking for. For example, I'm looking, if I'm looking for a, this function that can match my features to my dependent variable in the space of linear functions, then I'm facing with just type of OLS regression. If I'm 
mapping my um, features to my dependent variable و, and my space of functions that I'm looking for is the uh, uh, step functions, then basically I'm in the decision trees uh, or things like the uh, tree like uh, basically algorithms. And if I'm looking even more complex, if I'm allowing for everything, uh, trees and also basically uh, sigmoid or different more complex type of functions, they am there. Then basically I'm in the neural network environment. So the big picture of all of them is the same. I'm looking for a function that can map my uh, features to the dependent variable. And I want to find the parameters of my function in that uh, space in the best possible case that uh, achieves some performance, for example, minimizes uh, mean square error or things like that. So again, the question could be a classification or regression problem as well. So regression, if your dependent variable is continuous, for example, stock prices, you are feeling, we are dealing with the regression problem. If the, the dependent variable is binary or like uh, categorical, we have a classification problem. So let's uh, uh, a little bit talk about these type of linear methods with uh, penalty terms, regularizations. So as I said, when I'm looking for uh, you know linear type of uh, functions, then basically I'm looking for the best weights that can map my features to the dependent variable. So in this case, then my the way to compute those weights because my, I, my functions are set of functions that I'm looking for are linear is to minimize equation three. So I'm trying to minimize the error term which I get from my label data. This is the dependent variable that I observe in the data and what I get from the model which is X times G. And G are the weights that I'm looking for. So if I'm solving this, means that I'm minimizing the error, uh, this quadratic error. That's why it's called ordinary least square methods. The beauty of this method is that it is simple. It's easy to understand in a sense of what's going on inside the uh, method because I have a closed form solution uh, for this equation three. So which is X transpose X inverse uh, times X transpose Y. So this is, very good because I can easily understand what's going on in this linear method. But uh, what happens when the number of features is very large? So let's say you have K where the number of features and N is the number of observations you have, but you have many features and your features are very large. It's bigger, much bigger than a uh, number of uh, observations you have. So this is potentially the case when high dimensional data. So in this situation, when this happens, then uh, this metric uh, X transpose X will not be invertible. If it is not invertible, so, uh, and that you can get many solutions. And as a consequence, your G or this uh, coefficients, the optimal G that you find here uh, may not be stable because you have left several solutions because this may not be, uh, Basically, this will not be invertible. So how to resolve this? In order to resolve this, we go towards this type of uh, regularized versions that actually very, they perform very well. And they are very, uh, usually in banking literature. And also uh, when, before neural net become very uh, uh, exclusive in terms of applications and uh, people were using this type of methods. So, the way we do it is again, we are minimizing this error term, but we are going to be penalized if this uh, coefficient is very large. And depending on how we pick this coefficient, if it, the penalty term, if it is L2 or L1 term, we're gonna get different type of regularization. It, in this case, I'm using this L2 term, meaning that I'm going to minimize this uh, G transpose G. And the good thing about is that since this function is differentiable, I can get a closed form solution again uh, for this reg uh, regularized version, which is called ridge regression. And as you see here, if gamma is zero, we get back to the OLS. When gamma is going up, when the penalty term is bigger and bigger and bigger, these coefficients become smaller and smaller. So the beauty of this is that you still have uh, these coefficients and um, but you can manage them and make them smaller and smaller. 
So they, uh, with this, we can handle uh, this type of uh, situation that you have a lot of features. But one issue about ridge regression is that you still have the uh, parameters there. You still have this G's for all of them, for all features, you have something bigger or equal to zero. But, and let me show you this as well before going to the other one. In particular, if your, um, your, your data is orthonormal, meaning that X transpose X is identity, then you can get this relationship, nice relationship between the OLS weight and the regression, ridge regression, which is uh, basically uh, is OLS regression or, uh, coefficient over one over gamma. Where if gamma is zero, you get the same. If gamma, as gamma goes up, this coefficient goes down. But one issue about ridge regression is that, as I said, you still have the coefficients. They become smaller, but you still have them, or they are bigger or equal to zero. But what if you have many features in your problem? So I have tons of features. One uh, method that we usually use to reduce the dimension is uh, called lasso regression. So lasso regression is like ridge regression, but if the only difference is that you are going to change the penalty term. Instead of L2 norm, we are using L1 norm. You're still minimizing the error, but you have L1 norm. What is the cost? What, what, we are, uh, what is the issue with this? This function is not differentiable. So we don't have a closed form anymore. But what's the plus we get is that it's like, uh, then you have a lot of zeros. You basically can kick out a lot of features. And by this, this is helpful when you have uh, when we are facing the problem that have that has a lot of features and you want to reduce the features to make it uh, manageable, we can apply lasso. So that's a, a beauty of that. But what is the issue with lasso? Well, it is not the, the issue, the main issue of lasso is the selection bias. You and the tuning of lasso could potentially be difficult. And uh, but and this is a potential an issue, uh, selection bias, and, uh, but still is one of the most important methods that we can use uh, for feature selection that uh, commonly used in the literature and also in the industry, because very easy to use and also interpretable. Now, now, if you want to do both of them, there is, as I said, there's an issue with lasso as well, but if you want to resolve both of them, then we use elastic net. In the elastic net, we, can, we use the combination of both lasso, uh, L1 norm penalty term, and L2 norm penalty term. And this will enable us to handle, basically, the good thing of both ridge and regression. Ridge regression and uh, uh, lasso, uh, basically, uh, uh, feature that can reduce the uh, features. Okay, so as I said, I want to talk about trees as well, but uh, let me um, pass, I was thinking I don't have enough time, so just a little bit uh, talk about trees, but then I talk about neural net. Well, as I said, in trees, the same thing, we are again, remember, yi is equal to fxi plus epsilon, the same thing, we are looking for a fun set of functions, but this function now is not linear. We are looking for a step functions. So it's more nonlinear. As a result, we have a better out of sample prediction. So let me pass trees, go to neural net. Again, neural net, exactly the same. So again, my function, however, is more general. I'm looking for a set of functions, f fxi, that uh, basically can be sigmoid, can be uh, tangent hyperbolic, can be any type of nonlinear functions. And actually there is a result in, um, this is usually called activation function, that um, a simple neural net, one layer uh, neural net can handle, uh, can actually approximate any function. So they are very good in approximating any function if you have enough, uh, uh, nodes in the single layer. So the logic, as I said, is exactly the same. You are trying to compute the weights to minimize some uh, objective. Let me show you, for example, here. So uh, you want to minimize, let's say, mean square error. Your function is f of x, i, and theta. And where theta are the parameters of that neural net. But rem remember, neural net, you can use any functions now. For example, rectify linear unit or tangent hyperbolic, and you are trying to compute those weights that are here. For example, these parameters here, and g could be any function here, and that is your function 
FX representative of this, and then you are trying to minimize your error. Yeah, the same concept as I did in the linear regression, but I am allowed to use more complex functions. As I said, one issue with this is that since I'm using more complex functions, the issue with that is that overfitting, how to deal with overfitting, exactly like linear regression that I use, uh, reach regression, penalty terms, I can add a penalty term here, which is, uh, let's say here, in similar to the reach regression, those L2 norm, here is again L2 norm. So I'm trying to minimize the weights based on that. So similar concept. So as you see, all of these methods in terms of big picture are very similar, but you are changing the functions that you are looking for to map your features to your dependent value. And the way you are dealing with overfitting, et cetera, is also similar, usually regularization, uh, you know, penalty terms, or using more data to train. So that was a big picture of what's going on about the methods and so, and just the algorithms, the trade-offs, what is good, what is bad, the issues corresponding to those, et cetera. So let me talk about a little bit of what can we do with these applications, uh, what can we do with these algorithms and their applications to finance. Well, uh, what is the main, uh, basically, application we get from this? In typical econometrics methods, uh, we usually look for causal explanation between the dependent variable and the independent variable. So for that reason, usually people uh, uh, use this kind of a linear regression, where they're going to asset pricing like CAPM, et cetera, to, uh, you know, different application in macro and microeconomics that we look for kind of a linear regression. But what do we get from ML is the following. Basically, ML allows us to obtain a unique insight from high dimensional data. This will enable us to deal with like alternative data, for example, audios, videos, images, text, etc. But what is the main uh, application of machine learning and deep learning? or these kind of nonlinear methods in finance, or what are they about? Basically, I can say the main application of these in finance are in three, four. The first thing is to basically uh, construct a superior and noble measure that uh, can map features to your dependent variable. And that means using different uh, conventional data that are just unconventional data that are used. Now with this, we are enabled to deal with text, which is a very high dimensional data or images or audios or videos and see the information. How can we use this information uh, to understand the dependent variable better? Another application that you usually have seen is to reduce the prediction error. Like the example uh, I was talking about in the housing prices. When you are trying to understand, for example, a stock price or like a credit risk or like a weights, et cetera. If you have whatever prediction you are dealing with, uh, you can use this method to reduce your prediction error. And another application of these methods is to extend the existing econometric tool set. For example, we want to come up with a better uh, or new uh, causal methods. So you can use, for example, text which is alternative and use machine learning like a, neural, uh, like a neural network to handle this high dimensional data as a part of my causal, uh, causality problem. I'm going to show you some examples of each. So uh, let's just start with this construction of uh, superior novel measures. So by this, I mean like in a coming up with diff like what does that mean? Basically there's examples of this like measure of sentiment, measure of corporate executive characteristics, measure of firm's characteristics, and actually some of them are pretty funny. Let me show you, I hope this table is readable, some of them, for example, what can we do? Let us start with this category of measure of sentiment. Let's say the category, subcategory we are looking at is a stock and product. And the measure we are like, for example, a stock is the investor sentiment in social media. For example, let's say, your data is you're looking at Twitter or a stock tweet, these platforms, and people are tweeting. What they are tweeting is a text, so the sentence, and it's, it's some kind of is a bullish or bearish about like a particular stock, I don't know, something like Tesla. And then you wanna see if I'm tweeting something positively, what is the effect of this in the stock prices? 
or if I when I tweet something, um, do I have any alpha in terms of predicting the stock uh, going up or down? So what do I need to do is to come up at the first thing in order to analyze this type of information is to find the sentiment corresponding to this sentence. Is it positive? Is it negative? Is it neutral? So I need to change the sentiment. So I label this sentence with a number. So that's a sentiment analysis. Another thing, it could be firm specific. It could be related to the macro event. Again, think of it like you are in a Twitter or a stock tweet and you are tweeting or, the, or you are, uh, for example, consider sentiment analyst report. For example, I don't know if you have seen this platform Seeking Alpha. So the analyst uh, write like a couple of paragraphs about a particular stock. And what you can do is that you can basically read this uh, text, like a couple of paragraphs, and see if the uh, sentiment is positive or negative of this uh, analysis about the stock. And then you can, based on that, go long or short and see what is the uh, prediction power of this. So again, we are dealing with the text and we are trying to identify the sentiments of this. It's not necessarily for a stock, it could be products too. For example, think of it like a reviews that people write on uh, in Amazon when you they sell, a, a, a sell something and you see the reviews if it is positive or negative. That's a lot of information there. So we need to change the sentence or text from there to something in terms of uh, how bullish or bearish or negative or positive the review is. These are like common things which usually have seen this before. But the other thing, there are some of them are actually funny, is the measure of corporate executive characteristics. So for example, um, you can see the looks of the CEOs in a sense that like people have done this before. They look at the CEO images in LinkedIn and they see if um, like, uh, the relationship between their, for example, eyes and the location and how the, the you know, pose of the CEO and how risk taker their CEO is or the asset manager is. So the, from the image, we want to see the, uh, you know, the activity of the manager or CEO, how risk taker he or she is. The other thing is like emotion. That's actually a new uh, uh, paper come out that that's about the tone. For example, when uh, um, people recently found that they're basically, you can observe information in the tone. For example, in the earning call, when the CEO talks or C-level CTO or CFO start talking. So you see the text, but when he or she is talking, uh, from the tone, you can get extra information. If he, if he or she is bullish or bearish and the stock price accordingly priced this differently differently from the what in the context of the text. So the tone itself can be how bearish or bullish the CEO is. Again, I need for this, I need to analyze the voice. So again, this is another application that I'm dealing with alternative data to see the price reaction to that. And there are a lot of other applications too. So I just wanted to show you a couple of them. Um, Particularly, for example, let me quickly talk about another uh, application that is a recent paper, a recent, uh, recent paper of mine that I have written with uh, uh, Dimitri Livdan and uh, Norman Shorhoff. I say it that basically we look at the stock tweets, it's something similar to uh, Twitter. And there we found that we analyzing the text, we found that actually 60% of the users in a stock tweet have a negative alpha, meaning that when they tweak something positive, the stock goes down. So they exactly do, or when they say something is going down, the stock is going up. So exactly the opposite of what they say is happening. So which is, it makes sense because it's difficult to uh, predict, but there could be more than that. It could be pump and dump going on. It could be several other things going on. So the one thing is that one observation, we have that 60%, almost 60%, are anti-skilled, 20% skilled, and 20% unskilled. But the more interesting thing is that we observe that these anti-skilled people have more followers than a skilled one, which is very interesting. So these anti-skilled one have more followers. Mm -hmm. And we argue that this is this reason, the reason for this is that you kind of a, there is a homophily going on. So people think that they are similar to more anti-skilled one, that's why they follow them. And also, what, uh, what we did is that uh, basically we also uh, uh, construct a portfolio that we were going long on the 
scale one and we were going short on the anti scale one and we, the portfolio was the combination of the two and we find that the out of sample of this out of sample performance of this uh, portfolio is very good actually dominate the market portfolio so again, to address this question, we need to deal with text because the uh, stock tweet, you are, you are dealing with the uh, high dimensional text data. Okay. So let me talk about uh, the second, uh, a little bit more about the second application, which is the prediction error reduction. Well, um, as I said, one um, application of uh, machine learning and deep learning, particularly in finance, is to reduce the prediction error because the OLS or linear methods, they are not very good in out of sample. And because, and it makes sense because they are pretty simple. They are just a linear line. So what can we do with that? So the, obviously a lot of applications that if you just uh, aim for prediction error, for example, in asset pricing and trading mechanism, you want to reduce the error because you want to wait, you are looking for out of sample prediction. So for example, in credit risk uh, or like uh, other financial policy, but in, in, let me a little bit in more detail explain this with this table. For example, if your category is prediction asset prices and trading mechanism and subcategories equity, you can target like you want to, uh, you come up with the portfolio, to reduce your uh, out of sample prediction and to maximize your stock return. You, you want to predict, for example, volatility, covariance, equity premium, and similarly for bond or for an exchange derivative, uh, or if we think of it in a micro market microstructure applications, for example, you want to predict lifespan of trading orders because you are trading more frequently in a short time. These are the variables that, for example, y that you are trying to predict. Remember fxi plus epsilon equal to yi. So these are the uh, categories that you may uh, want to anticipate out of sample. Similarly, for credit risk, for example, and let's say, let's we'll talk, we'll talk about one of them, for example, real estate credit, uh, credit risk. For example, you are in a bank and you want to uh, decide about the loan, and that's why if we want as a lender, a bank or non-bank or fintech or uh, like uh, rocket mortgage, et cetera, you want to decide if you want to issue a loan to a borrower based on the characteristics of the borrower. And then you, as a result, you want to basically have an estimate about the default risk of this particular uh, borrower. So you have you want to predict that. So uh, things like that, or um, in the corporate credit risk, for example, if you want to uh, predict the corporate bankruptcy. If you want to do merger acquisition, so you want to anticipate what is a bank potential bankruptcy or the how what is the uh, you know what is inside the other firm. If you want to do M and A, so the out of sample prediction reducing uh, prediction uh, error is actually as you see as uh, most of the application we have seen previously are related to this part. I have like a couple of minutes left. So I, the, uh, the last one that I want to quickly talk about, which is very advanced and very recent application is about a, uh, extension of the existing econometric, econometric tool set. As I said, the main thing in econometrics usually we use is to understand the causal relationship between the dependent variable and the independent variable. But, uh, and as I said, machine learning approach are difficult to understand, but how can we use them in causality then if I don't understand what's going on inside that. Well, we can use them as a part of the analysis, which is very interesting to handle. And by that, we can handle very uh, difficult problems because a uh, machine learning like deep learning neural network will enable us to deal with like high dimensional data like text. So we can use them as a part of our causal problems. For example, uh, let me, uh, just quickly explain one application. So this is another paper that I have recently written with uh, Yoel and Piao Li and uh, Kunal Sajidwa. That um, basically what we do, we want to see if there is a gender bias uh, for patent data. So for the patent data, when the patent is submitted, uh, is granted, uh, the quality of the patent usually uh, computed by the forward citation of the patent. And the patent here is actually a text. You, uh, in order to, it's a huge text, 
So in order to analyze it, we need to change text to numbers. So we, there is a, uh, like a transformer called BERT developed by Google in 2017. We can use it to change the uh, basically long text to a, um, a vector. And then we use two neural network after that, one neural network for male and one neural network for female. And the output of these neural networks are forward citation. Now, what we do is that we use this architecture to compute the counterfactual in the following sense. Suppose you have a patent written by male, you pass it to BERT, change it to the vector, but then pass it instead of pass it to the male uh, neural network train, you pass it to the neural network trait for female to predict the former, uh, forward prediction. Uh, and the difference between the true uh, uh, forward citation and the predicted and forward citation is the bias. And from this, we found that actually pattern written by female uh, undersighted around 27%. So again, here is a causal relationship between gender and the text. And by what we use uh, like a mach uh, machine learning method on our networks to handle this kind of a high dimensional data as a part of the causality to compute the counterfactuals. So in conclusion, so these methods are amazing. They have a lot of applications. There's a trade-off between them in terms of interpretability and the auto-sample prediction, but at huge applications in finance in three different categories. One is to handle uh, text data, audio data, video data, image, and things like that, unconventional data. The other one is the redu re reduction of the prediction error. And with several applications, like for example, in algorithmic trading, fraud detection, risk management, investment management, price predictions, and things like that. Or you can use them to uh, basically extend your econometric tool set, like in causality using this alternative data. Thank you so much. And uh, if there is any question, please uh, ask your question. Great. Thank you so much, Professor Ali. And, um, you know, it's been great. We still have about uh, 200 plus people in this session right now. So there's there's clearly a lot of interest in, in what you spoke about. We do have some questions, but but before I move to the questions, uh, this is a, a you know final reminder for any student that who's still here, about 210 plus of you still here. If you still have questions, now is the time that you can ask the questions. We're going to ask some of the relevant ones, some of them to Jacob, some of them to Professor Ali based on what type of question it is. So I'm going to start with you, Professor Ali itself. I think Poojan has a, a you know you know quite a few questions, which is great, and and uh, you know Poojan seems to be interested in this topic quite a bit. Um, his first question is is about the use of CNN in finance. Um, so if you want to throw some light on that, that would be great. Yes, very very good question, Poojan. So. Uh, basically, uh, CNN is a, like a part of a neural net that you can handle images. So one application of CNN is that, uh, for example, you observe, think of it like in asset pricing or stock prices, you can look at the images of the asset prices and then, and you can also pass the data, numerical data, and you can see adding these images it will enable you to have a better out of sample prediction as well. So for example, you can use it for a stock pricing and then, you know, uh, like to improve your portfolio allocations. But uh, one issue with this, however, is that we know that the stock price is very noisy, signal to noise uh, is very low. But the other application, so it, it's still growing, people trying to use uh, images in a stock prices, but still a very, like uh, uh, research is going on because it's using that in a stock prices is difficult. But the other application that is very uh, useful is for example, one application of it is in like auction pricing. So in auction, for example, think of it like you wanna sell uh, a painting and uh, you see the pricing, the price uh, you have, the, for example, label data, you have a lot of painting, and you see the previous prices for these paintings. And then suppose you're gonna participate in an auction. You wanna buy, for example, an uh, uh, painting of an 
I don't know, a famous painter like Van Gogh or I don't know, something like that. Now, when you use CNN, you can learn from this what features of paints and painting are important when you want to beat. For example, you see from the previous uh, data set that you have used and from using CNN, you can uh, basically show that, okay, the face are important for this uh, painter or like, you know, I don't know, images, other type of things are important. And based on that will help you to when you participate in an auction, how to start to bid. Should you bid high? What would be the final price? Because you can use the images to anticipate the final price for this auction, for this painting. And then uh, using that, this will enable you to bid better. So uh, that is a main, I would say, a very good application of CNN because this is not that noisy like a stock prices, but people are using the stock prices as well. Because that was sorry for, the long, sorry for the long response, but that was a very good question. Because, uh, but uh, I wanted to elaborate more on particular CNN on that. Yes. Great, great. Thank you so much, Professor Ali, for that. I'll, I'm going to come back to you with one more question. And, and you know, my next set of questions will be for Jacob, which is a little more about the program and the career opportunities after that. But but just one more question from, from Poojan is about... Um, what are some of the most important data engineering and, and ML model, um, you know, machine learning model deployment in the field of quantitative finance? So, so how, how important is data engineering and machine learning model uh, in, in the field of quantitative finance? I think that's what you wanted to uh, you know, yes. ask quickly. Is it for me again, right? Yes, yes, that's really yes. Right. well. Uh, so the question is how important or what type of data we use? In so, so it's how important is data engineering and it's machine learning model deployment in the field of actually, Yes, it's actually huge. It's very, very important because, you know, every now firms are competing to get alpha hmm. and beating the market means you need to better data and particularly when they want to adjust uh, their portfolio, like using different type of data sets is very important. For example, uh, when I was talking about the audio, when the earning calls, when the uh, CEO is talking, they recently, for example, there is a new paper came out that when Jeremy Powell is talking after FOMC meetings, uh, it's not just a text. Uh, market is reacting on how, when the way he talks. So that means that the bullish or bearish, your hawkish yeah. or bearish, the, uh, uh, the, uh, central bank or the Jeremy Powell is affect the stock prices. So that means that if I'm working in a hedge fund or things like that, I need to be able to analyze this type of alternative data. It's not just necessary numbers. I have to be able to analyze this type of audio or images immediately um, as well. And this will give me an advantage to basically adjust my data. So is a very interesting era now, particularly with the invention of ChatGPT. It's a it will be huge um, uh, in the next five years, particularly with ChatGPT, which is a form of like uh, transformers I was talking about in terms of changing text to the numbers. So. Great. Thank you so much for that, Professor Ali. I'm going to give you a little bit of a break, but I might come back to you right after this. I'm going to move to Jacob. Jacob, there are quite a few questions that are, you know, something around admission. Some of them are around course curriculum related. Some of them are around careers related as well. So uh, if if I can quickly ask you the first question, which is around curriculum related. I think there was a question by uh, Karthik Sharma, who, who talks about the curriculum for the financial engineering is more skewed towards finance as it does not give a lot of weightage to machine learning and data science. Is this a myth? Would you like to quickly cover a little bit about the curriculum aspect of it, please? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, I would say that there is a core class that all students are required to take in their second term, financial data science, right? So that's one element. There are then two elective courses in the third term, which are uh, sort of elective-based courses in deep learning, all right? There is then a fourth course in the fourth term, financial innovation with data science applications. So I would say that there are dedicated courses in the curriculum to this uh, discipline, uh, some of which are core and required, some of which are elective based. Um, and then certainly, you know, elements of machine learning are going to be woven into other courses as well. Right. Sure. 
Yep. Um, you know, that's well answered. Thank you so much for that, Jacob. Jacob, I think, um, you know, Vamsi asked some questions about, you know, uh, his profile, but I'm going to try and generalize if you can throw some light on uh, some of the backgrounds of the students that you expect to come in, you know, you know, what would they have studied uh, prior to them applying for the master's in financial engineering program? Is this for any specific engineers itself? Um, you know, you know, would you like to throw some light on some of the student profiles that you're expecting in the program? Yeah, absolutely. Let me let me talk about this quickly. This is, um, you know, sort of there's a much broader, uh, you know, presentation on this and the specifics and all this information can indeed be follow, uh, found on our website. So before I answer, I also want to drop some links that I would encourage um, everyone and uh, Shrag, it, it may you may need to actually uh, send these across because I'm not sure if sure. I have the capability to do so. But um, let me answer in a quick summarized sentence right now. What we're looking for is that you've studied some sort of technical discipline. All right, that could be engineering, computer science, physics, mathematics, statistics. Um, that's not to say that if you've studied a business discipline, that's to say business, economics, or finance that you wouldn't be qualified, but certainly you would have a little bit more preparation to do, right? So again, technical skills, we're looking for courses in the areas of mathematics, statistics, um, certainly having good command of coding languages like Python, C++ are going to be crucial for this program, okay? Um, in addition to technical skills, we're also looking for, you know, astute communicators. So individuals who are, you know, have strong communication skills, whether it's oral communication or written communication, Right. These are uh, important skill sets that many of our employer partners are asking for as well. Uh, so I think that should give you a quick flavor. Again, I encourage you to definitely check out our admissions page because we outline all of this in much more detail. But in the interest of time, I'll, I'll sort of leave it at that for today. Great. Um, quick question again. I think this is a combination of some of the questions that um, you know Vamsi is asking and and some questions that Poojan is asking as well about some of the post-study opportunities in terms of what kind of companies, you know, Poojan's question is specifically to, you know, our top consulting firms like the MBBs, McKenzie, uh, Bain, BCG, and what are the roles offered in, in some of these, you know, firms? Uh, yes, there is the placement report that would be on the website and some of the companies would be talking about the average salaries, etc. But would you like to, you know, quickly give a little bit of a brief of what are the career opportunities after the program for the prospective students? Um, okay, let me try to do this uh, in as brief a way as possible. So on the sort of types of companies, you're looking at investment banks, asset management firms, hedge funds, um, financial technology companies, and then to a lesser, lesser extent, broader technology companies and some consulting companies, i.e. You know, McKinsey, Bain, BCG. Within each of those firms, there are different verticals or functional areas that a student might be able to go into. Now, we touched upon some of this, albeit quite quickly during the initial parts of the presentation. But within a bank, you're looking at roles in the areas of trading, portfolio management, research, strats, right? These are some, some of the other areas. Within um, an asset manager, right? Some of the roles are going to be largely similar. Right. So if I kind of let me let me go through some of the more common functional areas. And I think, you know, some of this is sort of agnostic as to what type of firm you're working at. But again, structuring and trading, um, data science, machine learning, research, uh, strats and modeling roles, uh, portfolio management, risk management, uh, consulting and valuation type roles, as well as um you know, what I'll kind of broadly define as quantitative development type roles, right? That are sort of uh, not your not your traditional software engineering type roles. So hopefully that gives this individual, you know, a bit more insight. Great. Thank you so much for that, Jacob. I'm going to try and get uh, Professor Ali back if, if, if he's available for some questions around, uh, yeah, just going to add you to spotlight as well. Uh, you know, for some questions around some of the topics, I, you know, Poojan again has a question about the importance of uh, calculus in, in financial engineering. So, you know, would you want to talk about, um, you know, because of the emergence of machine learning and, uh, you know, DL in finance, what is the importance of some of the, uh, you know, calculus that, that's been going around? Yes, uh, I would say, the, in terms of the technical prerequisite, 
for this, at least for the class I'm teaching, for the classes I'm teaching about deep learning. Uh, I would say the main uh, things, uh, linear algebra is very important, particularly to compute the weights. As I said, it's all about computing weights in all of these methods. You are minimizing some, some function. Uh, and probability is another uh, important thing. And uh, uh, some like, uh, like a calculus level because we need to take derivatives in order to compute weights. That is important uh, in order to understand the concept. Um, but uh, along with it, the more important, another thing that is very important, which is equally important, is the uh, coding ability, particularly Python, because most of these algorithms, uh, some of them, uh, we use like TensorFlow or PyTorch, and they are off the shelf developed. So we do not want to use them and de design them. Um, like, for example, if we try to, for example, have a text and we want to change the text to a vector of size, for example, 700, we use a transformer, and for example, BERT or GPT, uh, we use off the shelf. So, and these are the developed by Python. So the knowledge of Python will be very important for machine learning. Great. Uh, thanks so much for that. I think there are a lot of more questions that are coming in, but unfortunately we don't have the time. We're already about 15 minutes, um, you know, more that we have uh, scheduled, more than what we've scheduled. So there are a lot of questions around fees and, uh, you know, things like application fee waivers, et cetera, scholarships about a 15 years of education. All this information would be available on the website. Uh, what I would recommend is I've already shared the website uh, information in the chat. So go look at that study that in there based on that if you still have more questions that you'd like uh you know to ask the admissions team or or you know you know something specifically about this master class as well i would recommend that you um write an email with your profile to this particular email address which is already shared which is mfe um at host.berkeley.edu it's been shared as as well as the admission and the contact information from the website so what i would recommend is go through the website and then ask your questions via email um want to take this opportunity now to thank the 150 of you that are still here it's close to 11 p.m here in india it's about 10 45 p.m so thank you so much for each and every one of you that's joined in and a very very special thanks to professor ali who's taken our time it's it's close to 9 a.m now uh, uh back in california and jacob as well thank you so much for taking our time um early this morning to start this session. So uh, thanks so much. Wish you guys all the best. Any final thoughts for you, Jacob and Professor Ali, before we let you go? No, I would just say that thank you again for being with us here today. Um, and there was one final question here about the uh, application fee waiver. So we will send out information about that. But yes, as part of our uh, partnership with the SEED Global Education Organization, uh, everyone in attendance today will uh, qualify for a, a waiver. So look out for some additional communications from us on that. So without further ado, again, thank you so much uh, for being with us on the session today. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Goodbye. Good thank night. You so much. Thank Have you. a nice day.